Last time I gave an introduction to semiconductors and we ended by looking at a very oversimplified view of how an LED works. Today I want to go into a lot more detail on semiconductor devices. I'll cover some of the most common ones, how they work and how they can be applied in various circuits. I'm going to cover diodes, transistors, thyristors and triacs and I'm going to do a separate video on op amps because that's something that you're uh, using quite a lot in the practical. To understand these, you need to really understand how semiconductors conduct. So this was covered in the, uh, the last videos. Uh, you also need to understand the doping process and you need to be able to interpret these band diagrams. So they're really important. I'm going to start with diodes and I want to provide a bit of historic context so that you can understand how we've developed the technology that we now have and how it compares to some older technology. So in the late 1800s, um, that's when filament lamps were first invented. And the first filament lamps had a lot of problems because as you can see in this image here, um, they got a lot of blackening or darkening of the outside of the bulb. And that's because you got, uh, as the filament heated up, you got filament evaporation. Um, so basically some of the filament was getting so hot that it would evaporate off and it would get stuck to the surface of the, of the bulb. But it wasn't just the filament that was evaporating off, but you were actually getting thermionic emission of electrons. So the electrons were getting so hot and energetic that they would also come off the filament. This was a huge problem for light bulb manufacturers, but actually this led to an interesting observation and this led to something that we can actually uh, use in a device and this device is a thermionic diode and this is how it works. So let's say that we have a, a, a bulb and we've got our filament and it's connected to a power supply. So we imagine that this gets hot and then you get a release a thermionic release of electrons because they become so energetic they're released from the filament. Well, okay, so now if I were to attach another electrode through here and, and say we make that positively charged, then what we get is a positive terminal here and these electrons that are given off will therefore be attracted to this plate here and this will close this circuit. So if you were to stick an ammeter in the circuit, you would measure a current flow because your current would be coming from here. Well, we know that this is a one-way device because if we were to wire this up the other way and we were to make this plate negative, then no current would flow between here and here. So this is essentially how the first diodes were made, thermionic diodes. Uh, and these looked like light bulbs, right? They, they looked like valves tubes, vacuum tubes. So this is how the first diodes work. How do they compare to the diodes that we can make from semiconductors, solid state diodes? In the last series of videos, we talked about extrinsic semiconductors and how you can dope semiconductors to make their conductivity more useful, better for us and our applications. Well, we talked about P-type doping and N-type doping. And a diode is actually also known as a PN junction. It's actually made of two differently doped materials together. So you have uh, half, of the, half of the semiconductor is P-doped and half of it is N-doped. Now, what happens in this case, just so a quick recap on P and N-type doping. So P-type doped uh, semiconductors, they have group three, impurity atoms. So that means that they have the group three impurity atoms have one electron to few compared to silicon, for example, that the rest of the material is made out of. And that means that those uh, impurity atoms can accept an electron from the valence band and they become ionized and they're left with holes in the valence band and the holes are the majority charge carriers. So the material is neutral but the majority charge carriers in p-type semiconductors are holes which are positively charged and that's why we call them p-type. In an n-type doped semiconductor we have group 5 atoms which are the impurity atoms in, in 
place of the silicon atoms and so a very very small concentrations these have an extra electron that isn't involved in covalent bonding that can very easily enter the conduction band to conduct so in the n-type doped semiconductor the uh, majority charge carriers are electrons so we, we call them n-type doped because the majority charge carriers are negative of course both of the materials are actually charge neutral, but it's just the, the majority charge carriers. Now, at normal operating temperatures, in, in both of the semiconductors, you also get some thermionic emission of electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. So you still end up with some electron hole pairs so in, in a p-type doped semiconductor, you still end up with a few electrons in the conduction band, but they're the minority charge carriers. There aren't many of them, uh, and that's the, the same is true for holes in the n-type semiconductor. So when you put these together in a, an, an, a, a p-n junction like this, well, what happens here? you've got an excess of uh, holes. So holes that are free to move around in, in this region. And here you've got electrons that are free to move around and, and carry charge in this region. So what happens is you get a, diff a kind of diffusion process, right? Because you have a lot of free electrons here and you have holes here. And what happens when you first put these together uh, is that a few of the electrons will come over here because they, they, they are attracted by the holes that they see. So a few of these few uh, free electrons will diffuse and holes will diffuse that way. But that only happens for a short time because it very quickly reaches an equilibrium state. What happens is that the electrons that have migrated over here, they recombine with the holes, right? But because electrons, so this was charge neutral, this was charge neutral. Because a few electrons have moved over here, there's actually a buildup of negative charge in this region here because of these electrons that have moved here. So this area here becomes negatively charged. But the opposite is also true that a few holes migrated over here and they recombine with the free electrons that are here. And it means that this area here becomes positively charged. Because the electrons have moved over here made this negatively charged, they repel any more electrons from moving over. And these holes first move over here, they recombine with the electrons here, but this, this becomes slightly positively charged and you end up with an electric field across this central region. And that means that the flow of these, uh, th this diffusion is stopped because the electrons from here no longer migrate because they're repelled by the negative field here and uh, the negative charges here and the holes are repelled by the positive charges here. So you end up with a region here in the middle that is depleted from all charges. So no charges exist here. And this is known as the depletion region for this reason. So no charges exist and you have uh, an, uh, an electric field here. So this isn't connected to anything yet. It's just a PN junction. When you've put the, the, the P-type semiconductor and N-type semiconductor together, at first you get a diffusion process, so a natural process of diffusion, but this results in a buildup of negative charge on the P-side here, just here, because they couldn't get all the way through, they didn't have enough energy, and the, uh, a buildup of positive charge here. So you end up with an electric field going from positive to negative in this central region that's known as the depletion region. And it's called the depletion region because you have no free charges in this region anymore. So that's the process uh, and this is known. So here you end up with a diffusion current. So the diffusion current, the electrons went this way. So your diffusion current is going in that direction. So this was your diffusion current from positive to negative. 
Now, I said in normal operating conditions, at normal temperatures, you always get some, some, but quite small amount of thermionic emission from the valence band to the conduction band. So you always get some formation of electron hole pairs in a semiconductor like this. And what happens is, I mean, this is happening all over the place, but if that happens within this depletion region, you get an electron hole pair forming well, they will be swept away by the current. So if they form in this space, so you get a new electron hole pair occurring because they've got some kinetic energy. The electrons have got enough kinetic energy to, uh, to uh, enough energy to enter the conduction band. Then what will happen is they, if you get an electron here, well, it will feel this electric field that you have here that is built up because of these charges and the electron will get swept back into this direction and the hole will get swept back into this direction. So you get something known as the drift current. So the drift current goes in the opposite direction. So this is your diffusion current and the drift current will go in the opposite direction and these will cancel out because the whole system is in equilibrium. So if you were to take a measurement across this, these are really tiny amounts that you would measure, but you would, this would be like a source of noise because you get so few electrons actually taking part in this process. So this is the equilibrium position for a PN junction. You end up with these processes which lead to a P-type doped and an N-type doped semiconductor which have a depletion region in the middle and no more charge can flow. What happens once we apply a potential difference across this PN junction? I'll also explain this in terms of band diagrams shortly, but what happens is if I were to attach a supply to this, so I've made this side positive and this side negative. So that means that this side is positive and this side is negative for my PN junction. And of course, these positive holes here are going to be repelled away from the positive side here. And also on this side, my electrons are going to be repelled from this side. So what you end up with is the depletion region diminishes because these holes start moving over here. So you get a smaller depletion region once you're in this position. And this potential difference means that uh, you, the, the carriers have got enough energy, so the electrons here then have enough energy to overcome this depletion region because they're attracted by the positive terminal and you can get current flow through the device because these electrons have got enough energy to overcome your depletion region. So the depletion region becomes narrower and electrons can flow through the PN junction. If I now attach my supply in reverse, so this time I've made this side negative and I've made this side positive here, then the reverse happens. So the holes that are here become attracted to this side. So they kind of group together on one side of, uh, on, on their side of the PN junction. So they sort of group around here. The electrons are attracted to the positive side, so they move over here. So your depletion region physically becomes a lot bigger and no current can flow because these electrons that are here they don't want to come over to this side if this negative and this is positive. So your depletion region gets bigger and no current will flow, no charges can flow. So this is reverse bias. This makes a lot more sense if you look at it in terms of energy band diagrams, so that's what I'll draw next.